Built for structured logging, Seek lets you filter and exclude events by type, search by event properties, build dashboards, and configure alerts in seconds. Seek helps you troubleshoot and resolve issues more efficiently than ever before. Available as a simple Windows installer or Docker image, try Seek for free now at datalust.co slash seq. That's datalust.co slash seq. Friends, I'm Scott Hanselman, and it's another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today we're chatting with Ramon Widobo. He's calling in from Austria. That's right, from Vienna. Hi, everybody. How are you? I appreciate it. This is actually the first time that we've done this on Twitter Spaces as well as Encaster. So if you're listening to this live, you're hearing us on Twitter. And if you're listening to this on your favorite uh, MP3 or podcasting application, you're hearing the results of this experiment. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us today. So um, you do developer relations, but you've been a developer, a public speaker for a very long time, over a decade. That's um, right. And you and I were chatting earlier about um, learning in public and what it felt like to be public people who also fail publicly. Have you always had such a positive personality about being a failure in public, just like me? No, well, definitely not forever. I, you know, when when I when I started out, there was a there was a there was I felt a, a need to be to, to to strive for perfection for sure uh, hmm. and, and 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 I found that you know when especially I started out programming in in university and going to school and and learning there and I definitely felt a need to to do <laughs> as well as possible there in order to you know be successful and over time I found that by given being given the space and the privilege of being able to fail spectacularly. Um, it's been, it's helped me relax in that sense and, you know, get to know myself better and get to know the learners around me and realize, you know, nope, nobody has all the answers and that's totally fine. Why do you think that we as a, as a community, as a tech community got the idea that everyone was supposed to just write the line of code perfectly right off the bat? Like, why did we put people on a pedestal and decide that everyone needed to be perfect? And, you know, I, I don't know if I have a perfect answer to that because I'm still in the process of figuring that out myself. But I've definitely, you know, talking to people who are starting out on their journeys and as starting out on my journey myself, I found that I found that employers ex sort of, you know, during the recruitment process, give me sometimes give me this impression, especially when looking for my first first position, that I have to have all the answers. Um, I have to be able to to recite an inverted B tree. Um, I have to be able to, you know, on the spot, come up with an Express JS server. I, I mean, that didn't happen to me because I'm a little older, but uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Being able to create create tech from scratch without documentation, without the internet, this kind of made that a bit of an idea from my, at least from my perspective, this was something that that was going on. Mm -hmm. So we've been in tech for a long time. Uh, you've been in tech for over a decade. I've been in for a couple of decades. And um, I recognize that my privilege as being uh, old and also as being kind of a dude uh, allows me to do more failure uh, in public because, you know, when I screw up on my YouTube channel, um, you know, people will come out and troll me, but I don't feel like I'm being really, really attacked. What do you say to someone who has uh, a backpack filled with less privilege who is being told by someone like me or, or even you, you know, hey, go, go out there and, you know, fail in public. It's okay. I mean, woo. Scott, you're 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 hitting on something so important there because yes, people like like you know, I have I have that privilege of being able to of being able to fail because of my 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 relative you know of, because of my decade of experience because I, I'm a white man um, I I have I I I can fail in public and and you know and be called out and and ignored and in fact I've been tremendously lucky that so far that hasn't happened to me in a huge way maybe. Maybe when giving my first talk, <laughs> I did have uh, somebody in the audience who was rather nasty to me, but, you know, shrugged it off, kept going. I was still terrified at the time. This is, this is something that, uh, for better or for worse, we as a community need to do better with. We need to be more accommodating. We need to remember that we were, you know, at that position at some point where we were scared of going up on stage, where we were scared of pushing to production, where we were scared of sending in a job application. You know, doing these things for the first time, it's like it's it's like most skills, like they're scary at first. 
especially doing them in fr- performing them in front of people. Hmm. I saw this uh, this TikTok yesterday, and I, I'm having a good fun on TikTok, as you probably know. And uh, th- this person was talking about when someone gives you feedback, uh, and he was basically pointing at people in the audience and say, "I hate your blue hair." Now, no one in the audience had blue hair, but he was trying to make a point, and he says, "I hate Ooh. your blue hair." And the person said, "I don't have blue hair." And he goes, "Oh, okay. So what's the difference between me saying I hate your blue hair and you don't have blue hair?" And you're like, "Well, okay. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way." Versus someone saying, you know, you suck at programming or you're a lousy speaker. Yeah. And and the point he was making is that if someone tells you something that is blatantly untrue, but it feels personal, like you're not good at coding. Oh, no, maybe I am not good at coding is very different than if they say, I don't like, you know, your beard and you don't have a beard or I don't like your blue hair and you don't have blue hair. Yeah. One, one you can deflect and one you can't. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and even, you know, I mean, this, this comes down to a more personal level as well, you know, um, having, having people tell you for a few years, Hey, you're doing what you're doing is great. I really appreciate what the work you're doing. Some of that builds up into some, some kind of confidence after some time, hopefully (laughs) that reminds folks that, Hey, you know, what you're doing is fine. And one person, it's like, it's like reading comments, right? Um, and I'm very guilty of this myself. I'll read like I'll read hundreds of, of positive comments and I'll be very, very thankful. But it just takes one negative comment to bring me all the way down. That is so true. Yeah. That, yeah. Like uh, I had a TikTok go viral a couple of weeks ago where I was showing people how to do some some software emulation on this device. And the the, the majority of the comments were like, that is incredibly stupid. So it's like, well, did I did I not make the point? Like, I know I'm right. Yeah. Why did I make the point wrong? Should I go back? I'm not going to go and reply to all inter- every single internet stranger. Do I do a follow up video that no one's going to watch? Do I just delete the thing? And then I come back to this idea of why am I letting people on the internet who don't love me ruin my day? Yeah. So I just ignore them. It's something that's not easy to do. I find uh, it, 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 it's like, like any, like any other, you know, task we have to go through, it's, it, it takes effort. It takes skill. It takes patience. It takes practice to ignore those negative comments. I love that you said that, that right there, it takes practice Yeah, because people, I used to look at people who do a deal with trolls well and say, wow, you know, um, how, how do they come built in not caring? Yeah. But you nailed it. They practice. You don't come built in just like with a I don't give a F <laughs> attitude. You have to build that apathy <laughs> towards I'm putting good information out into the world. I'm sorry you don't like it. Moving on. Yeah. That takes work. That's like a muscle you have to to work on. Yep. Yep. And I mean, you know, it's it's it when it comes to something like imposter syndrome, right? I think we've we touched we've touched on this briefly before. Imposter syndrome, but in my experience. I'm not going to say this as an absolute, but in my in, in my experience, abs, uh, imposter syndrome is not something that really has gone away with time, but rather I found ways to deal with it. I thought I've built a, I've gotten this set of tools so that I can feel comfort, comfortable. I always say comfortable in my discomfort. Yes. You know, like, yes. As my friend Lovey says, she says, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Absolutely. And, 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 and. And something that, and this kind of comes in tech as well, you know, like when, when I'm working on a task, I, I did a lot of freelancing for the, at least, oh yeah, for the first 10 years of my career, <laughs> I was about to say life, career. Um, and, and and one thing that came from that was that I was jumping from project to project from, from you know, tech stack to tech stack. And that meant that over time I got comfortable with like, you know, jumping in, coming into a code base or, you know, coming up with my own code base and a new tech stack and being like, okay, where do I start? I'm going to be stuck for a while, getting stuck, you know, all of that. So I, I built up these tools to, for, to deal with my imposter syndrome. But then I moved to Devro a year and a half ago. Hmm. And all of a sudden, a lot of those tools, not, not, not all of them, but there was, there was a good, significant amount of those tools that didn't apply the same way anymore. And so I f- it was kind of like I felt a rush of new imposter syndrome. <laughs> but <laughs> I, lo- I love it. Ten years into the biz, you're like, ah, fresh imposter syndrome. Where have you been, my old friend? <laughs> it definitely <laughs> felt like a reunion. <laughs> um, but you know, over time, it just became something that I had to work on, th- work on in my own way again. 
Um, and, and I think actually one thing that's really been helpful for me is being open and honest about it is, is telling folks about it because the, the more I've done it, especially lately, I found that folks are really, you know, not just receptive to that, even people that I've, admi- whose work I've admired for years, you know, if I start opening up to them, they'll, they'll say like, oh yeah, you know, Hey, I'm human as well. And you know, that's what we all are in tech. And that's why I feel, that's why I feel like, you know, failing, failing publicly is something that's is or you know learning in public in general is something that's so powerful for that because it's it's just a nice it's it's just a very friendly reminder that we're that we're all learning and we're all doing okay the uh the idea that we're supposed to just know everything is so is so toxic and so uncomfortable but yeah. at the same time the idea that we all have crippling imposter syndrome to the point where we simply can't function is also toxic. It's a yeah. slider bar. And some days I will go to work and I'll say, wow, these people need to pay me more. I'm amazing. And then <laughs> other days I will be like, I am in so far over my head. I am impressed that they still let me work here. And it just kind of oscillates back and forth. But I know what I know. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I can do stuff. I have value and that's so important. And I still think about that. I've been doing this for 30 years. And I'm like, hey, I can make web pages too. So <laughs> you can't tell me I suck. <laughs> and you also know what you don't know, which is also something exactly. that takes with time. And and I feel <laughs> like and I feel like especially with especially with experience and one thing that that really builds up over time that I find really valuable is this ability to is to pick up those new technologies to to uh, translate your skills from one stack to another, from one uh from one competency to another. You know, you you sort of learn like with with tech, right? It's an on, it's an ever evolving paradigm. Things change over time, but we've learned to learn essentially. Okay, this is a perfect pivot because uh, I talk about systems thinking on the show a lot. Talk about learning how to learn. Um, I went to university. Uh, it took me about eleven years. A lot of people don't know this that um, I didn't graduate from college until two thousand and three. I was going to school at night while working full time. Um, how how are you doing in your school in uh, experience? Oh, um, I I'm in a I'm on a similar boat. Um, my bachelor degree in in software engineering is currently ongoing, and I started in 2007. So I'm on my 15th year of my bachelor degree. Wow. So I had a challenge with my bachelor's degree because after seven years here in the U.S., uh, it, it's kind of like a circular buffer and credit starts falling off the other side. And they're like, you need to complete it in a certain amount of time. So there was all kinds of negotiation and matriculation and conversations with the dean. Do you have any challenges with them wanting to you to finish it in a certain period of time? So it's kind of weird here. It's kind of a yes and no. Um, It's kind of an opt-in. You can, you can opt in. If you opt in to have your, your grades and your matriculation sort of brought over to a newer system, then that means you can take a break essentially. Okay. Uh, if you, if you take a break, you will need to like adapt your grades to the new system since I have it, because I'm (laughs) frankly, very, very, very afraid of, of having to do some of these courses again, because they're hard. Some of them are, are real hard. There are things like, there are things like, you know, Oh, what is it called? Like, you know, Lambda grammars and that sort of thing that, Oh gosh, I have to be honest. I don't really remember anymore. (laughs) Um, Lambda grammars, advanced calculus, that sort of thing. The calculus was the one for me. The idea yeah. that calculus was standing between me and putting text boxes over data. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm going to be taking data and putting a text box on top of it and binding that. And I need to understand differential equations. Yeah. And then, of course, when you say that out loud, there's two kinds of people in the world. The people who say, oh, my goodness, I totally hear you. Calculus sucks. And, you know, I knew calculus at age 11. It was so intuitive to me. You know, I don't know why anyone, why does everyone have a problem with calculus? Either way, it has no value when I'm doing data binding is all I'm saying. No, and, and, and you're, and you're right on the, you're right on the money there. That's that. And, and that's because of the, of the, of the broad variety of things that we can do in tech. It's, it's hard to really like narrow that down to a single degree um, that, that encompasses all of those skills. So I, I'm, I'm conflicted on it. I actually had a really interesting experience with my degree, which is that, you know, I started out again, privilege talk, like the, the, the luck that the fortune I had to be able to be living in a situation where I could do this. I studied for a while. I was, I wasn't doing so well. I was, and, um, 
I had to find my first job in order to qualify for a visa to stay here. So I started freelancing and then I fell in love with tech. Like I, I started freelancing. I was given, I was given an opportunity to get some experience and then it just, everything started clicking and it was fantastic. I was, I was learning version control, project management, all of those, some, all, some of those skills I was learning like, and I found, I found myself getting interested in the theory and eager to go back to school and be like, all right, let's, let's tackle the OSI model. Um, I th- it's, it is called the OSI model, right? You know, those seven right, layers yeah. of- Seven layers network. of networking, yeah. Right, right. Couldn't tell you what those are, but I was interested in them at the time. <laughs> and, 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 and going back and being interested in them, that, and that kind of went into also like, um, even though I haven't graduated yet, I have done my bachelor paper, my, my thesis mm-hmm. on, uh, so in, in between school, my, my, my spouse and I were teaching kids to code at my old high school. Uh, which really just took me down this whole like learning in public and, ped- and pedagogy um, path. Yeah, you um, never learn more than when you are teaching stuff. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. um, without a doubt. It's 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 great. It's it kind of feels like a hack. It's like you want to you want to learn something, try and teach it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if you yeah, and, and if you want to like, <laughs> if you want to fall, jump out of a plane. Right. You want to like, you know, you want to, Hey, I I, I'm having stage fright. Well, get on stage. Like, you know, like those kind of things, because you're falling out of the airplane and you're like, this is insane. This is insane. And then you land and you go, I want to do that again. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) The minute you step off the stage, the adrenaline is like still, is still coursing. You're still cold sweating. And you're like, I could do that again. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And your body is telling you this was a mistake, but let me ask you this though. You have a job. Yes. Why are you trying to get a degree and a four-year degree, an undergraduate degree at that? Oh, oh, what a, ooh, what a question. Um, and, and I have to, and, uh, and there's, ooh, there's so much conflicting stuff going on there because there is a, there is a, there is a certain degree of like, um, sunken cost fallacy going on there. You know, I've been at this for 15 years. There's a personal sense of achievement that I want to get out of there. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, Going back to if I, if I can just quickly um, go back to the to the whole teaching kid thing, so I, I, I you know I talked I taught for a few years and it was super fun. Then I came back to school and I was like, okay, what what could I write my bachelor thesis on? And uh, my supervising professor said, you know, if you've been teaching kids for a while, why don't you compare your experience, your 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 let's say, un un informal experience with formal like research and writing on. Uh, teaching children to code, which by the way, there's loads of. Um, and I have to say that experience of researching, writing up and, and learning about, you know, formal pedagogy against my informal one was in sp- like incredible, incredible. And, and it, and it, and it brought in things that I've been learning that I've been using to this day. I learned about, you know, uh, Piaget and, and, um, paper, you know, the, constructivism, constructionism, couldn't tell you what the terms are, but those, but the concepts stuck, stuck around. And, and that for me, that, that sort of like eagerness to learn really opened my eyes. I do want to take a moment for our friends who are listening, who may not have English as their first language. Oh, sorry. Ped- pedagogy isn't a word that you hear, you know, at the, uh, at the grocery store all the time. Uh, this is the method and practice of teaching. It's the, it's the how to teach the formality of that. And to your great point of teaching kids, anyone on uh, who's listening to us right now could go and teach kids how to code. Absolutely. They could just make it up and they might be good and they might be not. And the kids might learn or they might not. But to your point, there's the, Hey, let's learn to code kids. And then there's the research, which, uh, which, as you point out, there's a huge amount on the, here's the most effective way to teach kids to code. So it sounds like you went out there just like, woohoo, let's teach kids. Yeah. And then you applied the theory and I assume it made you a better teacher. Substantially. Not that I was terrible. I, some of those kids, <laughs> actually, I could brag. I could, I could sit here and brag. Some of those kids are now making, professionally making um, video games, which is just incredible. Uh, that's why we do it. That's why, that's we, do why it. we do it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, uh, and, but it, it absolutely like brought in so much and, you know, I mean, I, I could go on about teaching kids themselves because kids are like kids and, and, and relative and relative beginners are incredible to teach because they, they ask the questions that so many people that have been doing this for a while aren't asking. And this is something I wish we did more 
as 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 software developers because asking questions is incredible. It challenges us. It it it. <laughs> one of my favorite questions that I've ever been asked was um, during uh, during one of the during one of I was doing a, a Rails Girls workshop, which is a, a workshop for um, uh, bringing underrepresented folks into into tech through teaching Ruby on Rails, and. They asked me, so, you know, I was coaching at that. And one of the people, one of the learners asked me, hey, Ramon, um, why is it called a div? Hmm. And that question blew my mind because I had never, ever wondered why it was called a div. I felt like I was far in, far enough into my, into my degree that I just accepted it. It's the div is that thing that there's too much of in your markup or so I'm told, you know? Right. Or a span, like because reasons. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just like try to try to not use too much divs, and that's what it is. So you know, we went on a learning journey together. Ooh, boy, could I go into goodness? Could I go into that though? Because like showing somebody how you learn is also so empowering. You know, um, so so just being like, hey, do you know what? I have no idea. Let's let's hop <laughs> on a search engine. Yeah, and just find out why it's called a div. By the way, it's because it's short for divider. Which I would have never thought of. Incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thing when you think about this. We're sitting on top of this stack. You mentioned the OSI model and the networking model, oh, yeah. and then you're talking about all this stack of stuff. We talk about full stack developers. Who can really understand the full stack? You know, you've seen that meme where someone said that <laughs> computers are where we took a rock, we shot lightning into it, and we taught it how to think, and that's how like silicon is a thing, and you know, you know, you're not a real programmer unless you smelted your own iron and built your computer case <laughs> from scratch. Like at some point, you have to decide when to stop in in the stack. But at the yeah. same time, it's so fun to learn about those things. Recently, I went off and I built a uh, using a. There's a gentleman who was on the podcast named Ben Eater, E A T E R. Ben Eater has a 6502 processor kit that you can buy. Where you build a 6502 that pub, that worked uh, that that's what the um, Apple II ran on things like that old computers. Oh, yeah. You build it from original chips and wires, and I wow. it's unbelievable. Like I have breadboards that fill a table, and I'm building a computer and coding it, literally flash coding it in in low level machine code, not even assembler machine code, to get an LED to light up, and then to get eight of them to light up. And wow. like, that's full stack development. But here's the thing. It made me feel good. It didn't make my work at work any different. Should I require people to do that? Like, should Hey, before you get to use a garbage collector, you can't have Java. You can't have C sharp. You need to build a 6502 from scratch. <laughs> you need to allocate and deallocate memory manually. <laughs> manually, like, like my grandmother used to do, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, with, with, with time, you know, I have to admit being like having this stuff sort of having been exposed to some of these things and ooh, exposure, like learning by exposure is something else that, that we could touch on as well. But having been exposed to these concepts like memory management, how, um, you know, how, for example, the, the OSI model, for example, it's, 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 knowledge that I appreciate having. I don't find it cr- business critical. I don't need it in my day to day, but every now mm-hmm. and then, every now and then knowledge like this comes back to me and I go like, Oh, hold on. Is this equivalent to, for example, I was learning rust recently, which does a lot of this pointer stuff, which I learned ooh, 10 years ago when I was making Mac software, having that knowledge come back was, was kind of nice. Again, not critical, but it's, it's, it's 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 worth it's worth appreciating, and I think that's that's where that's why I'm I'm grateful that that I'm sticking around to school and that I I, I hope to finish that some hem, sometime soon asterisk. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm the same way. I did my degree in eleven years. It was a four year degree. I did it for me. I didn't need yeah. it once I had the job, but I needed I needed it for me. And I feel like all the things I learned, all the languages I learned, except for C, they're all dead. They don't exist anymore. Yeah. All the operating systems that I learned on, they're all gone, but I learned how to learn. Yeah. And I, I have a passion for what's underneath. You you, you gave that great example of a, a div and someone going, what's a div stand for? I was talking to a young person at work who had their Git CRLF, carriage return line feed setting messed up. And they wanted to know what's a carriage and what, where is it returning to? 
And I was like, oh, let's talk about typewriters and carriage returns and how it's carrying the paper and it returns the carriage to that. And I just went off. Yeah. See, I just saw your face light up, right? Yeah. <laughs> you you need you need ASCII codes for describing to the 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 teletype machine that I want to tell the machine to return the carriage and feed the line. And yeah. then it's like, well, wait a second. What's ASCII? Well, kids. That's the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And then you have to ask yourself, are we making their lives better or are we just teaching history? It depends on whether people have their spirits filled by this kind of fun. I enjoy it. Do you know, and and you know what this is, this makes me think of kind of like the way I'm experiencing this in real life right now. You've probably seen that meme of like, you know, um, young folks asking like, what's up with that save icon, that square save icon? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, the 3D printed save icon. The 3D printed (laughs) save icon. Gosh, um, you know, for context, that's a diskette, you know, a, 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 what is it? A, 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 not, a, they are called floppy. Three and a half inch floppy. Yes, three and a half inch floppy, but it's not really floppy because it's inside right. of a plastic container. Right. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's kind of that, isn't it? Like, not fully need to know information, just like, hey, fun fact, we used to, yeah. you know, we used to carry a whole bunch of data in these. <laughs> My, uh, my, uh, you know, I keep watching these things on YouTube where it's like, here's kids trying to use a rotary phone, or let's watch kids try to rewind a, v- a VHS tape. And I go talk to my kids that are 14 and 16, and they remember watching Thomas the Tank Engine with a VHS recorder. Yeah. So when I watch a 25 year old struggle with a phone or struggle with a VHS tape, and I'm like, well, why does my 14 year old know that? And why does this 30 year old or 25 year old not? And then what is the cutoff? And then when do we just stop caring? Yeah. Like, why are we holding on to the tech of the 80s and 90s? And at some point, it just becomes gatekeeping, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. And that's the thing I think is really great. Uh, and I like about both you and I like about myself is that mm-hmm. we acknowledge that to know these things makes you more well rounded, will likely come up as a useful thing occasionally. It's trivia, but it'll. Yeah. It'll save you some time debugging one day, but it should not be required. And we shouldn't use that kind of trivial knowledge of Absolutely. history to stand in, in someone's way. Absolutely. Yeah. So then here's the, the, the kicker question. Is school useful for everyone or just for you and I? <sighs> this, this, this is hard for me because, uh, you know, a lot of it goes into where you are as well that we need to take into consideration. For example, Vienna in Austria, at least when I was starting out, was kind of old school in the sense that, you know, you needed to have, you needed to have, you know, requirements for getting a job degree. Uh, you know, actually, they weren't even called bachelors and masters at the time. They were called magistrat um, or, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, and then they split it into bachelor and master. Anyway, um, you know, they, they they used to have these more formalized tick box styles of 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 recruitment, but things are changing things are changing here in vienna we have a lot more we have a lot more boot camps now we have a lot more um you know specific learning journeys do i think school is necessary no for getting a job in tech it shouldn't have to be i i'd love to know what you think scott well this is where is it engineering or not like Ooh. we want everyone to be happy and successful and we as techies that are presumably happy and successful, we say, wow, I can afford a reasonable lifestyle because I'm in tech. Therefore, I want you to join us in tech. So here's where it's complicated. Now I'm not an engineer. I'm not doing web pages. I'm a brain surgeon. Take all the same things that we just said and say, you don't need to know that theory. It's trivial. You know, who cares about Jonas Salk and when the, you know, the vaccines and stuff, just take a class. You can do a boot camp, and then we'll do brain surgery. But then you would argue, well, brain surgery is important though, and people could die. Well, you know, so are websites. I'm sure the guy in California who got null for a, a license plate is regretting that right now because now he's getting tickets for everyone out there who doesn't have their license plate in the database. And he is the null license plate. Therefore, he has like $65,000 uh, in, in fines. That seems like it affects someone's life. Maybe that person should have had a degree. And yeah. that's where you get into this thing where are we building houses? Are we building skyscrapers should a skyscraper architect have a degree or should they be self-taught why is it that engineering is not and i don't know the answer to that question that's that's a that's an excellent point because it, it, it because you know beyond beyond something as uh, you know beyond something like you know brain surgery all of these engineering things that operate on 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 life critical safety critical applications you know 
Yeah, I don't have a clear answer. And this is the thing, right? There's a, we, you just said, you mentioned this at the beginning. There's different kinds of engineering, right? There's text yeah. boxes over data. Then there's the person that wrote the firmware on my insulin pump, which has mm-hmm. neither rebooted, has neither rebooted nor crashed in 19 years. Wow. Right? Like that's important. Like if it's yeah. baby saving software, do those people require degrees? Do they, you know, I don't know. It's just so interesting how software has grown so organically that, we um, have so many people with the same title, software engineer, developer, but we all came from so many different backgrounds. I think it's both the strength and the lack of formality is maybe a weakness, but I don't have a good answer. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. But I think we do agree. We want people to feel comfortable to join the community in a place where they can fail safely like you and I have, and then learn from those failures and move and move forward. Absolutely. In fact, one of the one of the things that has made that really easy for me and inspiring for me is uh, live streaming. Um, I really I really enjoy coding live because it it essentially demolishes any per, any possibility for me to be perfect. I can't be perfect if I am live. I can't you know I can't you know I don't know um, you know look up something and have it on the background and then like edit it to be perfect because I'm live. And and what I love about that I actually had an experience. I taught a I taught a JavaScript bootcamp uh, online for free uh, earlier this year. And I got, I, I was, you know, doing these, they were like hourly, the, the, these were daily one hour sessions. And we were doing some exercises from free code camp live. And uh, so I was doing one of them and it was a, it was on a complicated JavaScript object uh, problem. And I was going through it and suddenly I realized I, I was massively stuck. Um, and I spent a good 40 out of those 60 minutes just, you know, crying on the inside, if I'm perfectly honest, just sweating, trying to understand people in the chat were trying to help me being like, Hey, why don't you try doing this? Uh, I'm so lost. If he's lost, I'm even more lost stuff like this. And it was, I did manage to eventually figure it out, but it felt, it felt, it felt bad at the time. Well, now you could have just stopped the stream. I, I could have. But, you know, it was a dedicated lesson. I didn't want to just, you know, abandon everybody. So I thought, all right, let's just put our, I'll just put my head down and, you know, try to my best to, to, to follow through all the way to the end. And I did manage in the end to, to solve the problem, but I still left that lesson feeling rotten. But I got a D, I started getting DMs from folks later on, just being like, hey, Ramon, that looked really rough. Congratulations on uh, finishing that exercise. P.S. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for showing me that even even somebody who has more than 10 years of experience can get tripped up by what might seem like a rudimentary problem, a, a straightforward problem. And that floored me. And it's something mm-hmm. that I carry around to this day. It's just like, you know what? If I if I mess up in public, that's okay. You know, we've all deleted, we've all deleted a production database maybe once or twice. <laughs> Hopefully not <laughs> too many times. But you know, it's happened, to, or you know, I've deployed Mac apps that have been completely broken. Um and it's okay. You know, it's, yeah. it's not something you want to do every day, but you know, it happens and having a good strategy. It's like, it's like most daily day to day human interactions. You do mess up, but it's how you, it's how you follow up that really matters. Fantastic. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. Oh yeah. Thank you, Scott. This has been a joy. We have been chatting with Ramon Huidobro. You can catch him out at ramonh.dev on the internet. And uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us. This is our first Hansel Minutes where we also did it live on Twitter Spaces. So thanks to our friends that showed up for that as well. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 